I I will say like, I, I and I don't. It doesn't really mean anything for the context of this game. I don't think because Real Madrid are we're gonna lose this game. Like they were gonna lose it. It was four zero, and we really had no solutions. Like in previous games, we at least maybe had a response. I think it was kind of shocking to me that we had no response. But like you see, someone like Ceballos come in, for example, in the second half. The game was lost, sure, but he worked really hard. He had a lot of energy. He had a lot of dynamism. He was trying to win the ball. He was trying to progress the ball. The other thing was that, you know, we've spoken about this so much. When they, when Carlo makes that sub, uh, Rudiger for Cruz, I think it was. Am I getting that right? Or for, for Modric. Modric? Modric? Okay, Rudiger for Modric, Modric which means Kamavinga goes to midfield. Kamavinga all of a sudden just plays way better. He's getting in between the lines. And I think that was one of the problems that we had from a tactical perspective was that in that in that first half, I mean, you look at it, you look at the numbers. It's like they put out a graphic on the screen after 15 minutes, Real Madrid have, have completed 13 passes. City are like well over 100. And it, like did, it barely got better. I was shocked that we had 40% possession by the end of it. But you look at the way we're playing and there's a complete disconnect between the front three and the midfield. You know, Vinicius and Rodrigo, they're trying to make runs behind the shoulder of Kyle Walker and Akanji. And we are not hitting long balls to them. And there's no short passing lanes available. Like, everything is cut off. And Modric and Cruz were so deep. And then you needed movement between the lines. The only reason that sometimes it worked, like once in a blue moon, was because Rodrigo made the effort to come around to the left or to the midfield to connect it a little bit. There was a disconnect. And second half slightly better just in the sense that Kamavinga moved to the midfield and Ceballos was very proactive. But, you know, these are some of the things that I think next year we, I agree with Ed, like if Cruz and Modric are here next year, they can't be playing the same role. And you just really hope that too many will get going next year and take that leap the way Kamavinga has this year. And I think, you know, we can have different conversations. Mehdi, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, on the, yeah, on the Kamavinga Part. I'll actually like bring the discussion to we've we've been talking about tactics a lot, but I think uh technique is also one of the things that gets gets you know discarded in, in some of these conversations because uh as Sid mentioned that Man City is getting to do this because they have sustained a structure or organization over a lot of years and which has now layered into the, this beast that we are seeing out on the football pitch. Uh, from a Real Madrid's perspective, like I'm skeptic that we're ever going to see that if our recruitment, especially like our recruitment and the the coaching level, uh, is how it has been when we recruited Ancelotti, because whatever we see on the football pitch, it's an accumulation of how and it, what methods and how a football team is being trained, and some of the technical aspects of this Real Madrid side was like really lacking. One of them was like, there was a sequence where Kamavinga is actually going from the left back to the center midfield position and he was under pressure and he just received the ball on the wrong foot. We see the Thomas Tuchel's, the Pep Guardiola's, they talk so much about these body orientations, the feet at which you receive the ball, etc. Now, obviously Kamavinga, Vinicius Jr., these players are incredibly talented footballers. If you teach them stuff, they will be taught. But the thing is, Kian, the game is evolving at a such fast pace, you know, range that uh, the intuitiveness or quote unquote, the power of friendship tactics that we joke about on, on Twitter, uh, uh, that that has its perks, that can has its moments like we had in, in the last season. But the intuitiveness is going to get trumped by technicality, trumped by technology, trumped by the use of science. And whichever teams are going to embrace those, those teams will thrive in this next era, like Manchester City, like Bayern Munich. Like Newcastle is not third on the Premier League table by accident. Brighton is not sixth on the Premier League table by accident because they're embracing these things. Real Madrid, as a club, we can recruit managers, we can recruit players, but unless that culture or that continuity is not brought uh, in the club's methods, I don't think we will get how Manchester City is dominating teams. I don't think we'll get that kind of domination anytime soon. So as as 
as critical or as brutal it was to see the team fail on a tactical level, some of these technical deficiencies are also like it literally hurt me that Real Madrid players receiving the ball on the wrong foot and then just not knowing where to go when they're pressed from all four angles. It was just sad to see. So yeah, I think on a tactical level, on a technical level, it was it was just awful. Yeah, I just want to uh, add. Sid, sorry, I just want to jump in really quick. Um, go ahead, go ahead. Eduardo has to leave, so I just wanted to uh, get some final thoughts from him, and then we'll we'll jump over to you. Um, I'm just gonna go back to one of my old uh, uh, comments. Uh, it seems to me when I listen to some of you that uh, you want a Guardiola on our bench for ten years. I don't want a Guardiola. Uh, we are not. We don't play like that. I don't want positional play. Uh, all this, uh, uh, what we do is different, and uh, it sounds like uh, this lack of continuity is a huge problem. And we've been to eleven semi-finals of Champions League in thirteen years. I mean, there's no one more successful than us, so it does work. <laughs> Believe me, it does work. Uh, so it's it's good that that uh, that we want to have. We we have more than. We've, we have more than of a style that we that we like to believe. There's a way that we play, and we've discussed this uh, before. Um, that um, it pains me to hear that uh, that that we don't know what we're doing. That uh, I mean, all teams go have ups and downs. We've had. A, man, a magnificent spell by any measure. Of course, we should have done different things this season. But again, we're now playing with some uh, some limitations to our ability to to hire talent that we didn't have before. And uh, even though we've been competitive, extremely competitive for for the last decade, so uh, let's just not give up. Uh, we don't want to worry the other, really. We don't. <laughs> and and you're getting definitely... a standing ovation in the chat as you leave. <laughs> that the whole audience is standing up in their living room applauding you. What a what an exit. Okay. Now let's talk without um, without all this uh, drama so recent. This it, it's it's tough to talk like this. But let's have another chat uh, when La Liga is is over. And one other thing that I wanted to say before I leave is that the season is not over. We need to finish on second position. We do need to finish uh, better than Atletico. It, I mean, if we finish on third position, to me, the, the season is a lot, a lot worse than if we finish second. It may, it may seem uh, kind of a, a, a last second detail. It's not. I mean, and not being the second in such a terrible tournament as La Liga is today, it's a humiliation. And if it's behind Atletico, it's even worse. Yeah, I think it's financially hurting as well if, if we finish. Yes. Third. Yes. Anyway, All right, I'll be Ed. back. It was a pleasure. We'll, have a, we'll, we'll talk about this more later. Thank you so much for joining, buddy. Sorry about that. Thank you, everybody. Good to see you. All right. Uh, okay. So. We have uh, we have more more touches now with the mics now that Ed is gone and uh, Sid. I know I cut you off, so yeah, go ahead. I, I think what you said is valid, and I didn't mention that part. That um, the perspective I'm taking is very scrutinizing. Are we the best club in football history? I think we're always going to be in the mix. We're going to have better years with this current strategy. We're going to reach more semifinals. I guess that's not something I should caveat. We're going to win more league titles. Are we going to be the outright best club in the history of football? That's just not something you maintain if you don't have a plan to conquer and dominate every facet of being an organization. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean having Pep Guardiola on your bench for 10 years. That does mean when you reach a Champions League semifinal, you dominate pressing angles and you receive on the right foot when you're being pressed. And I think that's where the key is. That level of attention to detail I know Carlo doesn't have it. And I think what's interesting is Zidane had it. Um, Zidane had it, especially in the second spell when he was winning the league, the blocks he was putting out, the way he was having them receiving, he had it. And I don't think it's 
in our history to not evolve. We've been evolving for a couple of decades. We've had podcasts purely talking about how we love the new transfer strategy. I think it's just about continuing to evolve. And, you know, if you keep the same coach, you risk not evolving next season. And if the dominoes fall here and there, maybe you have a few less seasons like last year, a few less decades like last decade. And, you know, as someone like me, I see those small shifts happening. I've been seeing it happening for a few years. And I think if we sign Bellingham and Bappe, bring in Zidane, sure. We have a good enough coach. We have a great team. We're going to look like the best team in Europe again sometime. But there's elements of Barcelona's approach, Man City's approach that you take, not so that you, not because your approach is bad. You take it so you can destroy them. You take it so you can become the Bayern Munich of Europe, where you win 10 in 10 years instead of five in 10. And I think the Champions League wins are great, but you know I'm not necessarily of the type to buy that they'll continue happening at that rate. I think winning the league every year, you know, is something that Man City have done and it gives you a certain credibility. And I think as I do, as um he said before he left, with La Liga getting worse every year, I just think the standard at which Real Madrid is evaluated is slowly shifting. The Premier League is where the money's at, more powerful. Um again, everyone can have their own perspective on this, but I think we should be looking to be the absolute best and I think it's hard to even reach the level we were at the last 20 years if you don't have that mindset, which they do. It's just a question of what decisions you make, you know. I I, I guess like some part of me also feels like sometimes we we make it like a debate, tactician versus man manager. And why can't why can't both things be true? Like you need someone who can come up with solutions in moments like this. We need someone also to manage the locker room. Like I think Pep has both. You know, Klopp has both. And um, and you know, like someone like Chabi Alonso seems to have both. So like you don't, it doesn't need to be one or the other necessarily. Like I, you know, like Ed will say, and Matt's jumping on the call now. Ed will say, you know, no to like a Pep Guardiola for ten years. But I, I personally don't see much of a problem with that logic if. If if a manager like that comes in and gives you a, a system that guarantees success and sustainability, and um, you know if you get players to buy in and you're efficient and you can maximize your strengths, and then you do it. I, I guess I don't feel too strongly either way. Bottom line is I just want to win. So whoever can make us win makes us win. But you and I'm curious to know like what you feel as kind of like an outsider looking in. Like, do you? I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, if the debate is tactician or man manager, you know, you can find someone that has a bit of both. I just always point out Real Madrid is the most unique club in the world in this sense. The coach has to be a tactician, a man manager for the squad, and also a diplomat for the politics, the mess that Spanish football can sometimes be. Um, Ancelotti, I think, fits all those things. If you lose Ancelotti, maybe you get a better tactician. Maybe you find a better man manager. You also need the diplomat. I mean, Real Madrid is the most unique club in that sense. And I think Ancelotti is the kind of guy that ticks all those boxes and next season should be fine. You look at these two seasons, let me put it this way. The six tuple, the six trophies, the ones that you can win. Real Madrid have won those six trophies over the past two seasons. Okay, Barcelona won it all in one year, whenever that was. Most clubs have never won those six trophies, like, ever. To win all of those in two seasons for Ancelotti is pretty impressive. To get to another Champions League semi-final two I would say just run it back with Ancelotti because he is that coach that ticks all those boxes that gives you all you need from the coach and then you look at the squad I mean he's going to be criticized there's going to be calls for him to leave I just you know a lot of the the criticism will be about this game but after I think we've all we all know that we're overreacting here and that's kind of why we're here so let's like lean into the overreaction that's going to make a better podcast but by the time we get to next week everyone will have calmed down a little bit about this game, but I think the stain on the season will be the league campaign. But put it this way, Real Madrid have not won back-to-back leagues, kind of going to Sid's point. Real Madrid have not won back-to-back leagues since 2007-2008. This is not a club that wins league titles just 1-1-1 after the other. So that's more, I think, about the club than about the current squad, the current coach. I think run it back with Ancelotti next season, because with Real Madrid, you need a a tactician, you need a man-manager, and you need a diplomat, because um, Real Madrid is is not only the most unique football club in the world, it's also one of the most important 
institutions in um, in all of Spain. You know, you need a politician in a way. Matt, welcome to the show, buddy. Hey, thanks, Ken. Hey, Matt. Hey, hey guys. Um, I don't know. We're like uh, almost an hour in. I'm not even sure what we've talked about yet, but we're just a lot of big picture discussion. What What was your reaction at the final whistle, though? Um, I think like most fans, just disappointed with the fact that we didn't compete. Um, it, it's one thing to lose to this city team because let's face it, they're the better team right now. Um, and they've they've annihilated many opponents this season. Arsenal, um, uh, pretty much everyone in the big six in the Premier League. They beat Bayern Munich. They beat whoever else was in their in their group stage. Like they've just been insurmountable this season so i don't think losing to them is as like requires a big overreaction i think where um where a lot of people are frustrated is just the fact that we didn't compete and that it wasn't a good game and that that first half was oh my god you wanted to tear your eyes out it was so poor um and uh things never really got going there was no real change and i mean apart from a couple 10 10 minute cameos like it just never felt like anything was going to get going um, City are much the better team. And so I think kind of going off of um, what I've heard you guys talk about Ancelotti so far, where my head's at is, um, I mean, I've told Ruben before, I'm kind of curious just to see what a, a third Ancelotti season looks like. We've never had it. Um, like, what does that look like? This first year and the second year have been kind of similar um, in 20, the in his first two reigns. So what does the third season look like? Um, entering the know, unknown. It's like entering a black yeah, hole. Maybe, exactly. Maybe it's a, tr- it's a trouble. Maybe Ancelotti's secret sauce <laughs> is that he needs three years. Yeah, or it could just be that it it's run its course and a third year is too much. Um, and I know, judging by the comments and some of the mo- more vocal comments, that people just aren't um, on board with the Ancelotti in campaign. But... I, I don't think that, I mean, I, I 100% admit that Ancelotti, I thought the tactics were horrible tonight. I don't know how much of that was his fault or just the players could not get anything going, but I think we were way too conservative from the get-go, and I think that's on him. Um, and I probably would have hedged my bet and had Rodrigo and Vinicius Jr. just playing high the entire game, just had them play no defense. Let's hit them on the counter. Uh, why were they within our 25 yard within 25 yards of our goal at any point. Like I would have just played a little bit more riskier. Um, But that's, this is one game and yes, this La Liga campaign was disappointing, but I don't think we'll see Barcelona overperform the way they did um, this season. I think they're in a position where they're going to have to sell players again uh, this year. I think it's going to be a very different Barcelona team that we're competing against. Um, and like we've like I heard you guys all talk about it's Real Madrid how how few times have we gone back to back in La Liga this isn't just an Ancelotti problem so let's see I'm willing to go a third year I'm also I won't be terribly upset if he does go coach Brazil and somebody new comes in like I'm kind of indifferent to it at this point but um, I I do think Ancelotti has done enough to get the third year can I make a point or is someone else cute? Here? No, you, you guys jump in whenever you want. Like, I, right. I will try to leave a void after each comment. I, you know, with Carlo staying next season, the whole, I have one problem with the whole like pro Carlo thing. And I honestly can be talked into it. But my main problem is this look at every player on both sides, compare them athleticism, technique, physical ability, mental strength. There is no way they were 5 1 better. And more than that, I couldn't think of many things Carlo could have done tactically that could have changed the game. Matt, I know you say that they didn't have to drop back. There were times when they didn't drop back and we still got torched. Didn't matter whether they dropped back or not, in my opinion, because City were always faster to covering all the passing angles. And then when we pressed them, they ensured that they ripped apart our press. It was as simple as both sides of the ball. They controlled the angles. And you know, if you can take a team of players who aren't like, like I like City, but I just didn't think Akanji should be able to destroy Rodrigo like that. He should not shut him down. Like what? Akanji played for Dortmund last year. Like what is this? Like 
uh, Kanji <laughs> turning into this like insane, <laughs> like what? Come on, he was he was the one of the stereotypical ball players who couldn't defend, and he's shutting down Rodrigo. I mean, Walker. Holland Holland also played for Dortmund last year, and you know, but uh, yeah. ironically, but Sid, Holland was Sid, not is that even tactic? why we lost. I don't. I don't know. That I don't know where this Dortmund uh, slander is. You, you played for Dortmund, and <laughs> <laughs> you're not allowed to. Why are you mad at Dortmund? You can't sign Dortmund. Bellingham now either. What did Dortmund do to you? <laughs> <laughs> I but I get. I don't know that that's ta- tactical, Sid. Like I think that's more our guys just didn't compete. Okay, but last year, if you remember, before the last 15 minutes when the Bernabeu completely overwhelmed Manchester City along with the players. There was a 20 minute stretch when they did the same thing 50 around the halfway point of the second leg to the 75th minute around the time they scored the first goal. They just kept passing the ball around and we didn't do anything. Once they scored, we kicked into gear and I get that we didn't have that gear, but at that moment when we could have gone out and Grealish almost scored on us, I was just thinking like, this is pathetic. We barely pressed. They controlled the angles. They controlled us in our own home. And I feel like they just perfected what they almost finished last season. It felt like they progressed and it didn't feel like we quite progressed from last season. And I'm not convinced Carlo, what he pulled off with Benzema and Vinicius when he came in, I don't know if he has much more to add than that spark of getting our attackers freed. I don't know if there's much more evolution for him. And I'm happy to be proven wrong. If any of you have ideas from his time at Milan or other clubs, maybe there's a way we can evolve. It's just this whole... Let's figure it out every game. Let's press some games, not press some games. Let's turn on the press for a month, turn it off for a month. I don't see if that works. And I think Xavi and Pedri will see Barcelona focus on La Liga. I don't know if that's a win. And I think Lewandowski stays. So we'll see about that. But yeah, what do you guys think the tactical evolution would be like? I'd love to hear it. My, my like about Barcelona, just a quick point. They, I think my hunch is they will get Lionel Messi back. Uh, I honestly don't see our La Liga chances as big as they might appear right now, or if there are any, if actually Lionel Messi comes back, because uh, probably, like, he, he's still pretty good. He's he's still pretty good. And in this Barcelona system with Pedri and, like, everyone playing for him, he's pretty, pretty good. He's going to, like, score again, like, 40 goals a season, something like that. But, yeah, with Ancelotti, I'm, I'm also... In the sit camp, I'm I'm not entirely convinced that this team takes uh, a leap under Ancelotti, or there is actually anything left to see that might be drastically different next season. Of course, Ancelotti still has his pros uh, along with his cons, but uh, the cons are just outweighing the pros for me right now. So I, I don't think we're going to see something extravagantly different, and especially with like, are we getting a new forward next season? I don't think so. Are we playing, uh, like, are we getting something very different with the same version of Benzema? Uh, I don't think so. So, yeah, with, with Ancelotti, it'll be, I think it'll be difficult to sustain even whatever we have right now uh, because, yeah, the, the cons are clearly outweighing the pros. But isn't it going to be difficult with any manager? Benzema getting older, how do we replace him with Carvajal? We we have him and Lucas on contracts. I mean, it's, these problems will be here no matter what manager we have, no? Uh, I think, so, The how I see it, these players, they are, and Real Madrid, we, at least this bunch, this, uh, this dressing room is really nice. And these players have been, like, since they're six years old, they are brought up with adherence to the manager, adherence to the coach, adherence to, to a system. I as uh, even mentioned, like the stain of Real Madrid this season, and I'm I'm not mad at mad that we got out of the Champions League. I'm so much more mad that we lost the La Liga title to this Barcelona side. So the thing is, unless we define some kind of structure that is not decodable uh, by other La Liga teams, we're not going to get that domination in La Liga. And our that that next leap that has to start from La Liga that. That will not start in in the Champions League. Uh, it, it's not necessarily uh, what will happen with a new manager. I think Real Madrid just needs something different, something fresher than the the ideas that we have right now. They're kind of gotten stale, and teams are kind of like found out. Okay, Real Madrid are going to play intuitive football. Uh, we do this, we do this. We we will limit their opportunities unless we bring something fresh. 
that's not going to change at least in La Liga. So that's my main focus on like championing for a new manager. I think this is really interesting because like, I don't really necessarily know what a tactical evolution looks like. And I don't honestly, after tonight, I'm skeptical that Carlo will be here next year, but we'll see. Oh, oh but, one, one more thing. So you guys, I think are underestimating Florentino's jinxing prowesses because he said when he sacked Benitez, I think three weeks before sacking Benitez, he said, Rafael Benitez is the best manager in the world. He will lead Real Madrid for many more years. He sacked him three weeks later. <laughs> so the moment he said Carlo Ancelotti will be here next season, I don't want to hear about it. He has a contract. I kind of knew that, okay, Carlo, <laughs> your time might be up because yeah, don't don't believe Flo when he what he says about a manager. No, generally speaking, it's the kiss of death. Like Shea is saying in the chat, Butrogueno said he's staying an hour ago. Every single time we've sacked a manager, just literally moments before we've said they're staying. We give them a vote of confidence. It's happened to Lopetegui. It's happened to everyone I can never remember. But um, let, like, so like back to Ruben's like theoretical, like if you next, next year, like what gets solved? Like if you're given the same squad. Yeah, I'll volunteer. Or right, you go ahead, you go ahead. Well, I, I just want to say that I personally believe Real Madrid is too talented to be playing the way they do sometimes. I think they have the ability to impose their will on almost anyone. And I think tonight, fine. I think City is a better team. Um, and I, I actually asked Pep about this after the game. I said, you know, because in the first leg, Real Madrid were able to regroup at halftime and put out a much better second half. And I asked Pep, like, why? what did you guys do this time that they weren't able to regroup at halftime and do and and rebound in the second half and, and play a better game. And he said, one, it was the Bernabeu, got into it after Vinicius scored. He also made a comment about the grass of the Bernabeu, and he said because of that, he had to change kind of the way he played. But he also said that City were just much better in their pressing and their passing, which is, I think, somewhat true in the sense that, well, it's obviously true, but just also in the sense that City misplaced a lot of passes last, last game in, in Madrid. But I did want to say, like, I think, Matt, you, you spoke about this at some point. When you, when you defend as deep as you did today and concede four goals, and it could have been worse, it's a testament that playing more defensive doesn't always equal a better defensive record. I think there's a scenario where you play a more open game and concede less goals and score more goals. Because, well, for possibly because you get you just get more chances for Vinicius and Rodrigo in transition, but also you boost your confidence offensively and momentum shifts for both teams. And I think ultimately, in, this is hindsight, but in hindsight, it was a huge mistake to defend as, as deep as we did. It was not the conservative approach we thought it was. It was. It was probably less risky to just go out and attack them and bring the line higher and be more aggressive from the start. And Courtois said something interesting after the game too. Courtois, obviously one of the one of the ones who can actually has no blame, but he said at halftime, we tried to go and change things in the second half. But we just couldn't. We didn't have the momentum. And that goes all the way back to how you played in the first half. City just grew in confidence with each pass, and Real Madrid just decreased in confidence with each pass they were conceding. You could see like more like so many uncharacteristic touches tonight. Some of them they weren't even under pressure that much. And so I, I guess tactical evolu- evolutions and stuff. I think I, I, I think about this a lot, especially in games where you lose badly like this. I think you're, this team is too talented to sometimes be playing the way they do. And I think someone needs to just take this to another level. And I think Ancelotti's done an amazing job. And if he stays, he stays. And Hopefully you can improve next season. But I also, I think we need to come up with better solutions in moments like this. I think I'm seeing a lot of criticism of Ancelotti and not much criticism of the players when I thought the players were really, really poor today. Luka Modric, I think this was one of his worst Champions League games I've ever seen. Couldn't complete a pass. Kareem Benzema, how many times did he get pit pocketed? Um, Like so many players were poor. Kamavinga, first half, just couldn't couldn't 
plea to pass down the line. Like you're going to blame Carlo Ancelotti for that. The players were just bad tonight. You can't, I don't think, yes, maybe he didn't put him in the best context to win and to perform better. But at the end of the day, he doesn't control Modric's touch. He doesn't control the sloppy passes. He doesn't like, I think there needs to be more criticism of the players than just always blaming the manager. Totally agree. Yeah, we did. To be fair to us, we did say all that stuff before you joined Matt. Okay. Uh, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think, I don't know, I'll push back a little bit on if you redo it, could you have won this game? I think it's obviously possible. Nothing is impossible. I, I do agree that in most scenarios, if you replay it, City will still win. They're the better team. But I think if you re like, there's no way Carlo would look at that game in hindsight, be showed it to him, be like, hey, Carlo, you have a time machine. You can go back. There's no way he's stubborn enough to be like, okay, let's just do it, run it back. There's no way. You run it back if you if you played a great game and it was just a matter of math, like you just missed a bunch of great chances that you normally would take. You don't run it back if you just get absolutely annihilated. I So I think, for one, you'd have to change completely going into a defensive shell. I'll go back to what Courtois said after the game, that it was hard to find the confidence because City had too much of the ball. So one is, I'm not, again, I'm not saying you win, but one is you have to bring the line higher. You have to be more aggressive. You have to ha- bench at least one of Modric and Cruz. You could even just from the start try the Rudiger, Militao, Alaba, and then Alaba left back thing. And, um, or maybe even natural left back, whoever, whatever you want to do there, but put Kamavinga in midfield. You may even also, I don't think Carlo would go this far, but you may look at too many from the start. Either way, regardless of the selection of players, you have to play more aggressive. And at that point, what you need is early goal and hope not to concede. Once you go into halftime 1 1 or 0 0 or down 1 0 instead of 2 0. The momentum is different. The confidence levels in both teams are different, and I think that's what you would bank on. So I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think you, it's like Doctor Strange where it's like one in one hundred million chance. It's, it's probably like four out of ten, I think, maybe three out of ten. Right, um, I gotta bounce, guys. Thanks so much for. All joining, right, bro. Listening. Thanks, buddy. Good seeing See you guys you. soon. Take care. Bye. Uh, to Adib's question about the atmosphere, I did speak about it a little bit at the beginning of the podcast. Uh, I still, there's nothing that compares to a burnabout Champions League night. Nothing, nothing. It's uh, unparalleled. But I thought the Etihad was better than Stanford Bridge and Anfield, which surprised me. Um, Jacob Post. You there, buddy? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, awesome. Keon. Hi. Welcome. How's it? Uh... Thank you, um, and all the staff. Thank you for all the hard work. Really appreciate it. Um, just a quick question I wanted to ask. I think it's more question for the off season, but I'll just ask it now. Backup striker. It's a question that we've been asking for the past six months or so. About for me, I think it's an either or. Alvaro bringing him up or getting someone. Just from, I literally have no idea who else but Alvaro to just get from any other country or league as a backup. Um, It's a very tough question. So I'll just leave it up to you, Keon, and the rest of the staff. I'm sorry, but no, it's a tough question. But what do you guys think would be a better move, bringing up or getting someone from, from wherever? The picking a striker from within the league is is an interesting option. One that we just really haven't done that much in in um in the last few seasons. But if we're talking about bigger picture, how to compete in Champions League and the league at the same time, you know, this could be an option to find someone that can that knows the league well, that can hit the ground running, and that can play for you on Saturdays while you rest Benzema a little bit for Wednesdays and. I mean, just look at some of the the strikers that are near the top of the La Liga scoring charts. It's guys that could be, their teams could be relegated in the next couple of weeks. And they could be a Hosolu, for example, Espanyol, you know, Enes Unal, Hitafi. These guys that are absolutely not um, Real Madrid uh, level, but are they better than Mariano? Can they come in and uh, take up far less wages and, and come on and do a job every now and then? Yeah, they probably could. So... Um, the picking from within the league options is an interesting one, but 
the striker position for Real Madrid is it's it's trying to catch a big fish and uh, if the big fish aren't available, you do need to take a smaller one at some point because um, Benzema is only getting older and you know maybe some of these elite elite strikers don't become available um, to Real Madrid for for a few years yet. I think the the biggest challenge with finding a backup striker is uh, one to find someone who is willing to sit on the bench, mm. and two to find someone who is able to come off the bench and perform. Because, uh, for example, with a Matt's beloved uh, Jovic, for example, <laughs> he he was he was great at uh, different places, but when he came to Real Madrid, he didn't just had the ability to to come off the bench and have an impact. So. You need to find someone who is willing to sit on the bench, who can make an impact coming off the bench, who's also at the right price, preferably maybe uh, someone who can replace Benzema. I mean, to find uh, someone who, in addition to this, is also better than Rodrigo, better off the bench than Alvaro. Mm, it's not so easy. I like you and I like the Jose Lu shout because I, honestly, I hadn't thought about that perspective before. And usually when the club does that type of thing, they like to do it with former Real Madrid Academy players. And obviously, Jose Lu was uh, a former Real Madrid Academy player and has debuted with the first team before. Um, Him and Carvajal are married to a yeah. pair of twins. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's <laughs> easy for family arrangements on match day and the like, you know. <laughs> okay, fair point, fair point. So, yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's an interesting one. And I think your analogy on you have to catch a small fit. I think you're right. Like the market is so thin right now. We need a stop gap. I mean, if we're relying on Endrick or we're hoping for Holland later on in his career, well, you need a stop gap in between. So um, there's no one really else on the market. So I think you're going to have to find something that maybe doesn't enamor the fan base, but it's just something that adds a little more depth to the squad. I don't know, man. I kind of doesn't, Move the needle enough for me, someone like Kozilu. I understand. I, look, he scores against us all the time, so respect. But uh, I don't know if it was like Kozilu or... Who that, Kian? That's my what's, question. What's that? Who, who are you looking at then? Uh, Firmino or, or Dzeko. I mean, both of their Firmino, contracts are expiring. Uh... Veteran players... Uh, uh... Dzeko, I'm impressed. I mean, Dzeko, I don't know if you would accept that role, to be honest. Firmino may. Both of these guys are expiring for contracts. Firmino, uh, like if you look at the analytics, he hasn't. He's obviously he's played less over the last couple of years because of health issues. But when he's on the field, analytically speaking, he's incredibly efficient. And someone like that has the experience. You won't have to reshuffle the entire scheme because he's a link-up player. He can put chances away. Like I'm not saying like someone like him would change the game today, obviously, but I'm also saying that you need you need somebody. Um and he's better than, you know, players like uh you know like Jose Lu. Like people are complaining in the chat like 35 year old to a backup 35 year old. Again, give me the list of long like this is 35 the, the veteran striker who is pa- who is past his peak who is someone uh, who would accept that role is literally the profile you're looking for. That is the profile. 35-year-old. Yes, that's the profile. Uh, You can't go and get a peak striker in 27 who's going to accept a backup role to Benzema. So if you want to go buy a young striker, you have to buy somebody who's going to be accepting of that role uh, of a bench role to Benzema because Benzema's not getting benched. Again, this is a really, really tricky position to fill because if you... You have one more year of Benzema left. So unless you part way with Benzema now and start breaking the bank, then it's a different story. But we're not doing that yet. So that's that's I feel the like problem. The last player who kind of mm, filled that role really willingly and well was um, Javi Hernandez, Chicharito, that year, which was like a decade ago now. Actually, yeah. Morata, maybe less willing, but he did better. Yeah, there. yeah. Oh, for sure, there's been better ones, but in terms of like the willingness. Yeah. Love coming, getting subbed on with a smile on his face. I mean, Chicharito had like the best year of his life when he was like the backup at, at the Bernabeu. It's hard to find these guys. You need to find them in that sweet spot of their career where they're still good enough, but um, understand that what level they're at 
and happy to come on the bench, off the bench, and also happy to go and warm up and maybe not get brought on and be fine with that. It's hard to find that kind of player. Just a last follow up, just to your point, just very quickly. So, would you rather Firmino or Alvaro, Alvaro in that type of role to back up? Just right now, would you rather Alvaro get alone or stay Castilla or be the backup? Uh, I think I think Firmino is a better player than Alvaro is right now. But um, I also just want to preface the Firmino thing by saying, like, if you sign someone like Firmino, it has to be on a short term deal. It can't be like anything, like maximum maximum two years. Ideally, just one year, one year. Um, but maybe you have to play it two years just so they would accept a role like that. But it can't be anything more. You can't be married to these guys long term. Absolutely not. Um, so it's kind of like a stopgap. Again, like a Chicharito or an Adebayor, a veteran presence who is okay with that role, who comes in and provides you with valuable minutes, is not expected to turn your season around, but is someone who can be relied upon in those moments where your your starting striker can't play. Again, we're we're asking a, a backup to Karim Benzema, probably the best striker in Real Madrid history. We're not asking a backup to. Morata or Javier Portillo. Like, this is a really, really tough guy. This has always been a problem in Real Madrid history. Anytime you need to back up Luka Modric, uh, Tony Cruz, Marcelo, like, these guys are really hard to find backups for. It's always been the case. And if you find them, it's temporary usually because that player gets fed up and leaves. Kovacic, for example, Atraf, for example. Although Atraf, it wasn't really his decision. But you know, that's why I think point. probably. That's why I think they'll go with Alvaro and they'll be reluctant to pull a trigger on someone like Firmino. They were reluctant to get Jekyll before anyways. I think there was an option or maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, I think the backup will be Alvaro and it's going to sound weird, but I think Jude Bellingham coming in and sort of adding goals to the midfield will allow them to shift Rodrigo to the middle more often. Um, that's my take right now. That's what I'm really excited for when it comes to Jude Bellingham. Screw the midfield and the arguments over Valverde, Chuameni, Camavinga, Bellingham. No, like he's not the same phase of play as all those guys. He is really for the final third, in my opinion, the the last 40 yards of the field. And so I think the club and just going off their behavior, waiting for Kylian Mbappe, I don't know if they go and sign anyone. So I would expect it to be Alvaro with a lot of Bellingham and Valverde playing in more advanced roles. By the way, Ancelotti did say, I think, I think, I think maybe after the uh, com- press conference, after the Atletico game, he did say that Alvaro would be in the first team next season. So he did say it. It was it came out of nothing, I thought. But uh, if he said it, then I guess it must be, be happening. Seems so long ago now. But the thing is, like, I feel yeah. like you know. He also said Rudiger would start today. So uh, <laughs> he said he says a lot. He, he, he's getting confused sometimes in those press conferences. He gets carried away. But but. Uh... As you were the first person on the internet to break Ewan, he what? that that he misses ah, that question. Yeah, yeah. No one else picked up on that. I'm kidding you not. Like everyone at the press conference yesterday, I was talking <clears throat> to before the game, they were like, "Oh, Ancelotti, well, Rudiger will start because Ancelotti said it." But I was like, "But I was like, but Ewan said that it was misinterpreted. How did you guys not catch that? Ewan did." Yeah, this was at the end of the press conference and then a bunch of guys came over to the journalist to ask the question and was like, hey, did you say Rodrigo or Rudiger? I heard Rodrigo. No, I heard Rudiger. I was like, well, what the, what the hell did Ancelotti hear? <laughs> Anyone's guess. And then we found out that he also heard 